Hey, this is Brandon Vietti, one of the producers of Young Justice, and you're listening to Whelm, the Young Justice Files. Recognized Joe Moniak D05. Recognized Emily of Arden D12. Hello, team, and welcome to Scream Something, Volume 13. My name is Emily, and I'm here with my co host, producer Neil. Hey, everybody. In Scream Something, Emily and I will be sharing our initial thoughts and reactions for the episode of Season 4 that were released over the last two Thursdays. There will be plenty of ass during these episodes, but our team will be saving our deeper analysis for the the full episode breakdowns we have planned for after the season finale. Another assault on my meditation space. The Great One will not be pleased. You again. And with all of that out of the way, let's hand it over to Emily for... Hello, Megan! The titles for this week's episodes are The Lady or the Tigress and I Know Why the Caged Cat Sings. The release dates were November 18th and 25th of 2021. The in-episode dates were April 20th through 22nd. The directors were Christopher Berkeley and Vinton Huke, and the writers were Nicole Dubuque and Greg Weissman. Just in time for your next mission. Episode 7 opens on Mars, where McGann aggressively breaks up a white Martian extremist meeting to confront her brother about killing Connor, only to discover that McCom had nothing to do with the kryptonite in that bomb. McGann breaks down sobbing, McCom escapes in a boom tube, and we cut back to Earth, where Artemis, Cassandra Savage, and Onyx, along with tech support from Oracle, are on their way to Santa Prisca to get Orphan back. On Santa Prisca, Lady Shiva confronts Orphan, questioning why she abandoned the Shadows and joined the Bat family, while Artemis, Cassandra, and Onyx successfully infiltrate the island. When we cut back over to Lady Shiva and Orphan, we transition into a flashback where Cassandra was sent on a mission to kill the Joker after he discovered, eight years after the season one episode where it happened, that the whole Injustice League thing was merely a distraction and then turned against Vandal Savage. The Joker attempted to target the UN, but was thwarted by the Batfam, and in the resulting chaos, Cassandra was sent to kill him. Cut back to the present, where Barbara continues to be very worried about Orphan, and Artemis and the others successfully infiltrate the Shadow's base, and everything seems to be going just fine until Onyx turns on Cassandra. And then we cut back to Mars for maximum suspense. There, we learn that Emery will be accompanying McGann and Ja'on, Back to Earth on Baby, even though McGann's still in a very bad emotional place. And then we cut back to Santa Prisca, where it's revealed that Cassandra Savage was, in fact, the actual traitor, and that her injuries were of the result of a glamour charm, and that she was sent to steal secret League intel. (laughs) And we are just jumping all over the place. Flashback to the UN, where Cassandra attempts to kill the Joker, only for Batgirl to jump in and push the Joker out of the way, resulting in Cassandra slashing through Barbara's back. In the present, Barbara gets a lockpick to Cassandra so she can free herself and stop the infiltrators from delivering the League's data. Rictus, Black Spider, and Shade arrive to back up Cassandra Savage, but are thwarted by the arrival of Cheshire, who's there to help her sister. But before our heroes can free Cassandra, all of the shadows, including Lady Shiva, converge on their location, and we end on a cliffhanger. Episode 8 opens on a flashback to Cheshire and Artemis at the end of Infiltrators all the way back in Season 1, only to cut back to the present conflict between our heroes and Lady Shiva. Artemis buys time for Orphan by prompting the Shadows into a giant villain monologue by getting them to lay out the plan that's unfolded over the past few episodes. In short, a short summary for you all... 
Cassandra Savage was sent in to gain sympathy, steal Justice League intel, and create an opportunity for the Shadows to reclaim Orphan. Onyx was also tricked into overhearing the fake plan to place Cassandra as a mole so that she would act as a distraction, which would help the Shadows' ultimate goals. But before the monologuing can go any further, Cassandra finishes freeing herself and cuts the lights, resulting in a pretty darn epic uh, fight in the dark between the heroes and the shadows. But just when the lights are turned back on and all seems lost, Shade teleports our heroes out of the facility and onto the beach of Santa Prisca, only for Lady Shiva to follow them through the shadow portal. We then cut away from that chaos to Smallville, where the Kents have gathered for a family trip, and Clark has to explain to baby Jonathan what it means that Connor is dead, and while I'm still trying to recover from all of those tears, we cut back to Santa Prisca, where everything is awful all the time. <laughs> Indeed. So Lady Shiva baits Orphan into attacking her, and a mother-daughter sword fight ensues. Orphan brutally stabs Shiva, but Barbara is able to convince Cassandra not to kill her, and our heroes leave on the new Jittosphere. We then get the continuation of that season one flashback, followed by scenes of Sensei instructing Cheshire to recruit Artemis and Paula Croc telling Artemis to convince Jade to return home. In the present, our heroes patch themselves up in a safe house in Key West, but a call to Will and Leon sets Jade off and causes her to run away again and steal a helicopter that she flies back to Infinity Island. Our heroes pursue and Cheshire attempts to finish what she started with Sensei a few episodes earlier. But that potential fight is broken up by Artemis, who finally gets Jade to admit the root of her problems. She doesn't want Leon ending up like her. Artemis offers to help Jade overcome her trauma but Jade refuses to drag Will and Leon back into her problems until she has worked on herself. But Sensei and Rachel Ghoul offer another option. They'll help both Jade and Onyx overcome their childhood trauma and Shadow's conditioning if they both remain on Infinity Island. This Jade agrees to, and Artemis promises to regularly check up on her in the future. And the, episodes in, and the episode ends with a nice little montage of heroes returning to their families, and villains plotting their next moves. Let's talk about this time. <laughs> oh my gosh. Let's get into it. Superboy, are you all right? I'm fine. Feeling the aster. So to start all this off, I just want to say I was it was honestly just so great seeing an episode by Nicole Dubuque finally this season. She's everybody knows she's written some of my favorites in the past. And I was genuinely like really surprised during the Mars arc that I was like, huh, it's weird that we haven't gotten a, a Nicole Dubuque episode since she writes so many Miss Martian episodes only for it to become, oh, we gave the very emotional aftermath of the Mars arc to Nicole Dubuque. And I'm like, now it all makes sense. Uh and speaking of which, remember uh, in a crashing the mode a, a couple weeks back, a couple episodes back, I half joked uh, about the what the chances were that McGann would go, uh, as I said, full Galadriel darkness on Macom over the whole kryptonite thing. This is the exact scene I pictured in my mind, and I uh -huh, was this is the one. I was like, oh. Oh, they pulled that out of my brain. I was like, that's that's exactly what I thought McGann would look like if she went uh full <laughs> full Nova powers on this thing uh and attacked her brother. Hair flying in the wind, glowing eyes, uh whole thing. And I don't know, I was I felt there was a very cool scene, and I understand that this is a dark road that McGann should not go down, but at the same time I was like, I get it. This this makes sense to me. <laughs> yeah. The I've written it several times and I, I'm pleased to say it. I was just so surprised that we, we jumped back to Mars at all. And then the fun sentence that I have wrote to see McGann as the goddess that she is. Yep. This is the terrifying demigod half of the thing that I say mm -hmm. McGann is. She is both a ball of sunshine and a terrifying demigod at the same time. And this is that other side of her that we hadn't seen much this season yet. <laughs> yeah, and it was it was also interesting to see John be there and supporting her in that because I mean certainly he wants some of the same answers like that's just going to be true but then like that it's that he's there and also to clear up some potential confusion because I know it did come up that did any of those Martians die 
thankfully Greg um, jumped on via Twitter and said, no, they're made of hardier stuff than that. Yeah. So, um, because there was the little confusion um, as to which I was wondering the same. I'm like, oh my, how far did we go? But um, I'm pleased to find out, confirmed that we didn't go quite that far. The fact that to me, even just watch before everything happens on Twitter with that, even just me watching, I was like, I'm pretty sure nobody here is dead because uh, John hasn't said anything about it was kind of my uh, point of reference. I was like, because if if McGann had killed anybody, I have a feeling that John would have at least said something, (laughs) anything about it. (laughs) But still, very good scene. Very, very. I was just very happy that we got to see what was up with McGann because I have been worrying about her for episodes on end uh, and getting to just check back in though i do have some questions related to like the timeline on that since it's been um i'm trying to remember the exact number of days but it's like it's been almost a month of her on mars and she just went and investigated this and i get that that's probably just for keeping all the timelines straight instead of doing a flashback to mcgann earlier on mars and just having it be at the same time as everything else but i also just i'm like What have you been doing for a few weeks? Have you just been crying for a few weeks and then you transitioned into anger? Because that would make sense, actually. As I'm saying it out loud, I've answered my own question. (laughs) Yep, I was thinking the same thing. So never mind. I have no more questions about that timeline. (laughs) My questions aren't going to be asked right now. I'm going to go put something in Crashing the Mode. Carry on. Well, while Neil's typing something into Crashing the Mode... I did think it was a nice, interesting touch that apparently the Justice League just keeps an eye on all known kryptonite in the galaxy, just in case. And I did like the clarification that it is all known kryptonite. They're like, there's probably more out there that we don't know about, and that's always going to be a problem. But everywhere that we're pretty sure there's kryptonite, we'll just keep an eye on that (laughs) in case. Yeah. And then the assumption that i've made up until this time is that you know or how would you be keeping track of future kryptonite if the person in the sphere actually is from the future which is just what we've been theorizing this whole time and i'm realizing in this exact moment that there's nothing saying that that's true that they could just be someone acting now that the sure to yeah we don't know. It just it's literally it's literally dawning on me in this moment that I've just assumed they're from the future and I could just be wildly inaccurate. Cool. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Ian. <laughs> you hurt my brain. But to go into a little bit of the stuff on Santa Prisca, that's the correct. I love the team using team slang around not team people. The moment of Artemis casually telling uh, Cassandra and Onyx to stay whelmed and being met by general confusion is always fun. I I wrote the same note of just like, oh, yeah, like, that's not something everyone would know. That's just something we say all the time (laughs) and that they say all the time. And it's like, it's like unknown covert team that's using most of this language like unless you're in the know you don't know yeah it's like several dozen people in the world know what this is and i forget that sometimes yeah because there are characters that we follow so we're like yeah we know what that means but then just seeing every it's it's nice it's fun it's a fun little thing and it's the thing that's happened over the course of the show that i i feel like i remember greg weissman talked about this one time of just the way that the whole team over time just started adopting whatever stuff from uh nightwing just worked and felt like it made sense like season one there are so many that get listed and by season four it's like there are three that have stuck (laughs) there's like only three that anybody uses and that's it and it's fine (laughs) uh and it's just nice it's a nice little continuity thing it's fun Again, since all of my notes are always in chronological order and not necessarily grouped by storyline, which I should maybe consider doing, uh, to jump back to Mars for a second, there's a moment when they're when they're packing up and leaving where uh, McGann's parents say, you're not planning to come back, are you? And McGann's response is, I'm not planning anything, which is deeply heartbreaking 
and also makes me extremely worried about McGann. So I just can we can we get my favorite girl some therapy with Black Canary and just also some general team comfort back on Earth because I am worried about her deeply, deeply. Agreed. Uh, Very, yeah, that was. I mean, it was I mean, obviously it hits on like obviously she's not planning the wedding, but yeah, that deeper seated concern of like yeah, I'm not going to just plan anything, and like the heat, like the whole Macomb thing being the heat of the moment and invent, like doing it right now, and that's probably why John was following her. <laughs> everything is not planned again just ran out of the house one day and was like i'm gonna go uh mentally punch my brother in the face until he explains why he killed my boyfriend and john was like i'm just gonna we'll just follow along we'll just make sure this doesn't escalate but yeah all of that is interesting and worrying and heartbreaking and i just hope that this season continues in a way of getting her and Beast Boy and everyone the therapy that they need. Please, please. Uh, but again, this show has done such a good job in the past that that is not me like screaming at the sky being like, why can't superheroes have therapy? It's me being like, I'm pretty sure we are going to genuinely address this and that makes me happy. Yeah. So... Are you are you ready to get into this whole UN thing? Do you, do you have some initial thoughts on the whole Joker UN plotline before I get into my mini TED talk? So one of the things that that was interesting for me was that on first watch, I wasn't a fan of like the whole Joker monologue. I couldn't tell if it was that like I mean the Joker is the Joker and there's some aspects that like it's it's going to be all over the place because that's kind of the deal. But part of it was like I didn't I wasn't as engaged with the character as I thought I was going to be as it started to happen. What I found more interesting is that on the rewatch and then what I what's probably at this point, the third watch, like it really did start to grow on me. Like, I think maybe it was being disconnected from that character for so long that it was getting so much of it just felt a little bit off. Yeah, I mean, and so, like, I guess in a perfect world, like, would that monologue have cut shorter to give more in the UN? Um, just because you have so many characters that we know, you know, Lex, Troya, um, and, and so you have these characters in the UN, I think. And then, I mean, give me more Batfam, sure. But I enjoyed it a lot more on the second watch. Also, uh, this is the most random thing, and I don't know if I'm just, like, pinning two things together that don't really exist. Um, but the UN jokes, I'm pretty sure Greg made one of those in an ask Greg response <laughs> prior to the episode coming out. I, it, it just makes me laugh. I mean, either it, it was like right before the episode came out or right after it, but in one of his responses, he, he capitalizes un in his response to um, an ask Greg question, which just made me laugh. <laughs> More than I probably need to. With the Joker monologue, I know a lot of people have been talking about it and seeing people talk about that. And I feel like the first time I watched it, I didn't even really absorb it because I was so anxious about everything involving the Joker. And I'll get into that in a minute. But on rewatches, it is a it's like a it's a pretty good Joker monologue. I feel yeah. like part of it is just that everyone was so wrapped up in the Artemis plotline that I feel like some people were kind of frustrated of like, this is only a 23 minute episode or something like that. And it's only like 22 minutes, actually. I think this was one of the shorter ones. And like three minutes of it are Joker monologuing. And I'm sitting here just going, but what about Artemis? And like, I get that. It almost feels like, like, I feel like this monologue would have been much more well received by people in like a Batman Joker movie, if that makes sense. Like if Joker was the mm, focus yeah. of something and you got this monologue, you'd be like, this is cool. But since everybody's like, OK, so we're juggling multiple plot lines and also Artemis and also jo what? it's a lot. Um, oh, yeah. But but there's so much. Yeah. Like like I said, I, I think you 
you hit the nail on the head I didn't know we were going for. But on that rewatch, it's like classic, really well done Joker things of like pulling the camera <laughs> to look at the other TV, pulling the camera to look at the Injustice League, um, being super mad that the Riddler knew, uh, breaking the camera, um, being all like it, it's it's very it's it's young Justice's version of very classic Joker elements. Um, he's still his, his his unique version, um, voice acted really well. But I think you're right. I think in the heat of the moment, with all that was going on, it just it was it took you out a little bit. So anyone that didn't like it, my suggestion is go watch it again and just <laughs> just, just just go ahead and just when you're done, just watch all of the episodes again and yep. hashtag keep keep binging YJ. Hashtag <laughs> keep binging YJ. Like I on my rewatch, uh, actually laughed at the even Riddler new line. Like, yeah. The first time through, I was, again, I was so on edge that I was just like, only only the most basic important information of this monologue is being absorbed at all. I am just going to be tense until this episode is over. And then on a rewatch, I was like, that's actually a really funny line. Well delivered. So yeah, rewatches are good for many reasons. <laughs> um, so I'm going to get into some thoughts on the Cassandra Barbara scene uh, in the UN. That is what a lot of people have been talking about back and forth. So getting up. So here's my whole thing. Uh, so from the minute I sat down to watch this episode and saw that Joker was the thumbnail image and saw that Oracle's name was in the description, I was like, OK, I guess we're doing this. And I was honestly just so worried. It's no big secret that I don't really love the killing joke storyline. And I was honestly totally fine with them leaving the details of how Barbara ended up in her wheelchair ambiguous last season. I was like, fine, I am willing to accept this. I do not need to know. But if we're going to confirm what happened, and because it's Young Justice, I fully understand why they do that. They want to fill in the corners of the universe. Uh, I so much prefer this to anything even adjacent to the killing joke. Cause this scene to me, as it's presented in the show reads as a lot of things. It centers Barbara's agency and her brand of heroism. It's her willingness to save and to sacrifice. And it showcases her relationship with Cassandra and us getting to see what that is. And the thing I kept thinking about in the wake of watching that moment was just, Barbara is capable of extreme forgiveness, and that's so much more interesting and compelling to me than making Barbara's injury just one more bit of collateral damage in like the ongoing Batman Joker nonsense. Uh, so I thought this scene worked very well. And I know people have varying thoughts either way. Some people wanted them to never address it. Some people maybe were hoping for the killing joke and that's all fine. That's other people's interpretation. I like, I don't want to say I liked this scene because I'm like, this is still a lot and it's not like, oh, this is a fun scene I enjoyed. But like, I like this choice <laughs> is what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to find a good way to say I liked this choice. <laughs> No, I mean, yeah, all things considered, I, and I, I don't have anyone that I can have this this conversation with because, like, I didn't, I don't know that I got necessarily worried until it was in that scene with the UN. Um, and that, that's kind of my own personality of just like something's not something until it's something. And it was right at that point where it's like focusing on Barbara, where I was like, oh, oh, okay. Uh, I wonder what's next. We, <laughs> just in just in the sense that, like, up until that point, we had the whole Bat Fam. We, we, he was at the Joker was at the UN, but in the in those moments, that's where it like really gripped me of like, oh, okay. Um, and then yeah, to see what it became. What I find most interesting though is like the number of people that are probably watching this, and and it's been stated before that like their their introduction to the DC universe is Young Justice like. This was their introduction to Barbara being in the wheelchair um, and having nothing potentially leading them up to any kind of co potential conclusions. It's just a really cool thing, really interesting thing to think that, that, that in a way, Young Justice is rewriting that story for a subset of DC fans to that like this is their version. And that's just awesome. 
And I think it's interesting hearing you say that like you weren't worried about it until it happened because I literally every scene of this episode that was a flashback involving Joker, I was like, when is it going to happen? From literally from like the showing of the videotape, I was like his monologue. I was like, are we going to please don't do something like this? Don't because I know that that's kind of I don't remember all of the details of the killing joke, but there's stuff in that of him like sending a video to Batman or something like that or photos. It's photos in the comic. And I was like, I don't please don't have this be what it is. And then cutting to the UN and like the very tense breakdown of like showing each member of the Bat fam that is cutting the wire on a bomb. And I'm like, okay, we're taking out this threat. What's the problem going to be? What's like every single thing was me just being on edge (laughs) and that's my personality (laughs) in terms of this but also just that i'm i want to assume that that building tension was in intentional for people who know the comic storyline and everything and who are prone to picking up on that tension but it was very tense but a couple of other thoughts on this before we move on i also want to with in terms of all this, I don't think it's an accident that in that scene in the UN, when everything fades out and it's Barbara on the ground and the Joker starts laughing, that we see everybody else punch Joker in the face except Batman. I feel like it's kind of intentional of taking him out of that moment, if that makes sense. Like, I'm trying to process what this means, because like the killing joke injures Barbara and then makes it all about Batman in a weird kind of way. And I feel like this was an intentional way of being like, Joker's got to get punched in the face, but we're going to have it be the entire rest of the Bat fam teaming up to just repeatedly punch him in the face, which is cathartic in a way after everything. (laughs) Uh, And the choice of like graying it out and like I know we've talked about it before is like there there have been some interesting questions surrounding like the animation choices. But I always like to focus on the point of that. Those two words together is that there are choices, there are choices that are being actively made of like when it is these cut scenes and having more of the still motion when it's on Mars and nobody's talking. Nobody's really moving because like I'm literally conveying my thoughts through through my mind to yours. Yeah. Um, But also when it was like that telepathic connection and blurred out but also having that moment where everything grayed except for Barbara is really interesting. And that whole scene, like I've talked about it when I watched this for the first time, even though I was so tense and anticipating this at every turn, I still gasped when it happened. And especially on a rewatch, kind of taking in all of the details of that scene, because I don't even know if the like fading out of color fully registered the first time through because I was just... So much of Young Justice, like, I only catch on rewatches because I'm just so invested the first time through sometimes. And rewatching it, it was interesting to me, and I'm sure other people might have a different read on this, but it was interesting to me how much more restrained the portrayal of Barbara's injury is in comparison to, like, Even like even stuff last season, like season three has some moments where to communicate how bad an injury is, they show you a lot of gore. We have talked before about the introduction of Cyborg is a lot. And this moment that is so kind of iconically horrible in the comics is framed in such a way that communicates pain and fear and a lot going on without making it kind of gratuitously gory. Like all of the shots of Barbara's injury are from a distance and focus on like her falling and Cassandra takes off her mask that's covered in blood very quickly. It was just an interesting thing to me on rewatches of being like, there is a way this would be not not shot. I was about to say there's a way this would be shot, but there's a way that this would be drawn. I feel like in other in other, I don't I'm not even I'm trying to figure out what I mean as I'm saying it and I'm kind of failing. But does does that make any sense? Yeah, there there is a, a, a 
a go-to method with American television. Um, and for all of our international listeners, we certainly are okay with violence in a way that necessarily the rest of the world isn't yeah. um, in the way that other, other places in the world are more comfortable with illustrating sexuality through their media um, where we are not. And there is definitely a world where to illustrate the point of the severity of the injury, it is done with gore rather than with emotion, um, which that choice was not made, which I appreciate as well. It's like the the use of the heartbeat and the sound design and the fading out of the colors and everything else of that communicates to me as a viewer that this is intense and terrifying and painful without me having to like see too much gore. And I appreciated that as something that was to... It, works better for me as a viewer because i'm i don't i don't love i don't love stuff being super gory uh and especially with this scene that is supposed to be so much more about this being kind of a life-changing moment and stuff like that rather than it just being like violence for violence sake if that makes yeah any sense but yeah there's a lot to all of that and i hope we continue to see uh cassandra and barbara's relationship because clearly they have one, and I'm curious how that happened. Because some people are like, how how in the world could they be so close after that? And I'm like, I'm not confused. I'm just intrigued. <laughs> As I said, this means Barbara is capable of a lot of forgiveness, and I want to see how this happened. Give me more flashbacks. Yeah. the uh, In the midst of that, though, uh, Nightwing says, Nightwing to A33 <laughs> I don't know who the heck that is. It bothers me. That's all. That's all. You just want to know who all of the all of the call sign numbers are. And there's it's, a huge. There's a huge. There's gap a huge gap in there, and part of that gap is a thirty three. So, <laughs> who apparently is going to bring in a medvac? I'm sure. And I think it's funny because you're just like you know there's a list out there somewhere, and you're like just give me the list. I just want the list. <laughs> I know it's real. If you've gotten the numbers this precise, there must be a list and I must see it. I know you know. Yeah. It was, it was also interesting that it ended up being, that episode seven ended up being as short as it was. Now, don't get me wrong. Where they cut it? Absolutely. That's where it should be cut. Like, I mean, and whatever you put in or don't put in. And there there is something really nice about that freedom that they have because they're not trying to fit that mark um, the way that they used to on Cartoon Network because it's going to come out on HBO Max. Um, so, yeah, it was it was just interesting to, like, experience that again and just be like, oh, yeah, sure. That, that's how long the episode is. <laughs> that's exactly how long they felt it should be. Done and done. Yeah. I thought it was and I think part of it is that the kind of main plot of this episode was really just we got to get this group of people into this building and like so we have so many kind of subplots and flashbacks going on because the main plot of this episode is just kind of get people to point A from point A to point B and tie in as much uh metaphors about the complexity of sisterhood and relationships through counterpoint narratives and metaphors as we possibly can. Like, I think that's all like, I know some people were kind of talking about like, if this is Artemis's arc, why are we doing all these flashbacks and cutaways and whatnot? And I'm like, it's for narrative symbolism purposes. I'm pretty sure it's thematic. It's all thematic. It's about look at, if you look at all of the different, they're all about, family and they're about sisters and they tie to they tie together not literally but thematically uh you can tell i have an english degree <laughs> but moving on to episode eight fun fact from twitter apparently that very epic fight in the dark from episode eight was storyboarded by brandon vietti like he stepped in to storyboard that scene uh and that's kind of just that's very cool the storyboarders on the show are, are awesome across the board. The show is very good and very cool. Uh, who would have guessed lose, that we you think said this is across good. the board? And it made me very happy. Continue on. <laughs> <laughs> Unintentional puns. But it's just cool to see that I'm just seeing everybody talking about it of how like that scene got handed over uh to him, of him just kind of stepping in and being like getting to do that again and getting to do something that he used to do. It's very cool. Uh and that scene is very cool like it's such a cool fight scene and i also 
want to point out that one of the things I really liked about it, especially on a rewatch, is like this idea of a fight in the dark comes up in a lot of action media. And one of the things a lot of especially live action media does to kind of just communicate like this is in the dark, but we want to do cool things and stuff is like using machine gun fire as like a strobe effect. And that can get really like tiring on your eyes and hard to watch and hard to follow. And so I much preferred what we did on Young Justice, which was like focusing on like the glowing elements of people's costumes and just vague outlines and occasionally having those moments where something would light up and fade out and stuff. And just it's all so detailed and so cool, especially on a rewatch, like the all of the moments that happen in this fight and the fluidity of how it works is amazing. And I really liked that there was not like constant machine gun fire strobes so that we could see anything because I don't I don't like watching that <laughs> in action media. It just I'm like it's just going to give me a headache. Please stop. <laughs> so this yeah. much cooler. Yeah, the other version is like you have like the alarm light or the usually like that red light because and then I'm not a, a huge fan of that consistently as well. Um but yeah, it was just amazing to see that Brandon because you know we've had him on several times, but that's where he got his start was storyboarding. And then, it, you know, and then it seemed like because of how many people we've talked to that have been on the show and seeing where their careers end up, it's so interesting to see like this interesting parallel of like them leveling up and growing <laughs> with the show. I, it's, I mean, it just is what it is because like, you know, Christina Soda is directs one of these episodes. And then, like, where Matthew Bordnave is gone and he's working on X Men 97 now, and just like these, like, watching these people that we've seen do exactly what the team is doing is so, so interesting. It's um, all the metaphor. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and I'm on board for it. That's good. You're that was, on, that was intentional. Yeah. That was intentional. Yeah. Fully intended. I assume. But yeah, one of the best fight scenes by it's, far. It's and for real some reason, good. I love this crew. I think. Like, as much as I think I'm supposed to, Shade, amazing. Black Spider, hilarious. Rictus, terrifying. Um, like, your your legs and hands were both cut off in this, and that didn't phase you none at all. Yep. And I think it's very funny how much Rictus is, like, such a weird, specific, complicated character, and the show just goes, here they are. We're not going to explain anything. You don't need to know a backstory. They're here. They're going to fight somebody. And you just have to deal with it. <laughs> yeah, no, it's great. It's a cool, interesting little crew. And it's awesome fight scenes across, across the board uh, in this episode. To switch gears for a moment, because I, I have to say it. I've said it before. I'll say it again. Superman compassionately explains the concept of death to a small child, and I'm just supposed to deal with that at eight in the morning? That was... I, the first time I watched this episode, literally that scene happened, and I was crying so hard that when it like cut back to Santa Prisca, I literally just had to pause the episode and walk away for a second to grab some tissues. I was like, no, you can't expect me to get back into the fight scene yet. I need a moment. Which is also one of the perks of HBO Max, instead of it being live on TV. I can pause it to collect my feelings. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, my heart is broken on the floor. Let me just pick all that up. Yeah, as the closed caption read, because, you know, we, we go back to Craig um, chirping sadly. <laughs> um, in this one, the closed captions say, Wolf howling sadly and Wolf whimpering sadly. And in my notes, I wrote, us two, Wolf, us two. Yep. Yep. It's so yeah. good. No, I, it's so I, well done. I threw out the thought uh, recently somewhere where I, I think it was on our Discord. I was just like, so uh, who dropped Wolf off in Smallville and how much do I need to cry about it? Because. Uh, My thought was, does he live on the Kent farm now? No, because we saw him at we saw him at the at the at the house at the start of the season, unless he's moved there now. Uh, like well, he, my thought would also be like, is he, that where he went? Like while they were gone, are they dog sitting? <laughs> are the yeah, Kent's dog you know, sitting? Uh -huh, and that's where he stays. Maybe that I don't know if that's if that's better or if that hurts my heart more, Neil. So, 
Like, it's a very good thought, but I don't know how to emotionally process it. <laughs> okay. Because also, all of this implies that Wolf understands that Connor is dead and that oh, yeah. uh, that hurts. That hurts very bad. Like, I, it, so it tracks for me. That makes sense. But also... Who told Wolf and how does he understand and how do much had how much do I need to cry about it is the is the continual phrase for all of my questions this season. So yeah, no, that scene is very good. We have talked before. If you follow uh Greg Weissman on Twitter, he's talked about how they uh consulted with an expert to kind of get that conversation right. And have Superman say the right things because Superman should, because he's a good man trying to do the right thing. And so that was just interesting. It's cool. They've they've been very open on Twitter, Greg Weissman and Brandon Vietti and everybody of like talking about how the handling of a lot of subjects this season has brought in lots of different experts in the best ways to like present those issues honestly and i think that's very cool especially in like a big genre action show like this it's nice to be like also we're trying to get the therapy scenes continually right uh, kind of thing well and it, it hits on what we've talked about before certainly with jeff stormer and other super yeah. aficionados if you will is yeah. that these are the best superman stories because it focuses on the man not the super because he has every opportunity to just be an unfeeling god because his power set is just so ridiculous but it is those moments when instead he is a man that chain that make the best stories because nothing about being superman could change what happened it's very good i agree i agree to transition to a slightly less heartbreaking thing with kids this episode i remain very <laughs> i remain very convinced that leon when harper is the most well-adjusted child and child in existence <laughs> and it again that scene of her just being like look i made mom's mask uh just makes me go how much does this child know about That's her parents backstories everything is it everything <laughs> Did we did we very early on explain to Leon of like, yeah, mom and dad uh just, you know, run around with superheroes and mom was an assassin for a while, but she doesn't do that anymore. And but like, how how does one have that conversation with a kindergartner? And mm -hmm. I it just it's the th I've been joking about it for seasons now of like her in season three, just go into space for a bit and not not even phased by it. Like Leon Wen Harper is the most well-adjusted child. <laughs> and it's very funny. <laughs> yeah. It's on the face of Gog. And just we yep. there's no problems. She is she is uh she is regularly babysat by various uh superpowered individuals. She has some understanding of what her parents do, maybe not the full extent, but at least enough to understand what Chester's mask looks like. And just just many questions about how much does Leon know and how much does she understand that it has to all be a secret uh, and many other things. This is a good child. We must protect her. <laughs> Uh, other fun little things before we get on to the finale of this episode, I just want to point out that while I may have missed it the first time through, when Oracle says that she tagged everybody on the mission so that they wouldn't lose anybody, Orphan immediately starts checking yes, yes, every yes. edge of her costume for uh, trackers, and I love it. <laughs> I was like, that. it happens quickly in the background because everything Orphan does is silent and without a dialogue but i caught it the second time through i was like oh that's fun that's fun i like this <laughs> i have the exact same note of Good. just like i did not catch this in any way shape or form on the first watch but on the rewatch i caught every single piece of just like is it in my sleeve is it in my collar where is this thing because <laughs> you're focusing on worrying about cheshire uh, oh, processing yeah. what Oracle's saying, processing Onyx saying, I really wish I knew 
who we're talking to right now uh, and everything else. And you just kind of gloss over the fact that Orphan is having a very fun background moment. This is why rewatches are good. Finally, talking about Jade and that whole scene at the end. It's very good. I have many thoughts on Jade. I love Cheshire. I don't think I've I don't think I've been subtle about the fact that Cheshire is a very fun character who I very much enjoy seeing. Uh, but just getting that scene of Jade admitting that she feels too much like her father and doesn't want to ruin her daughter's life is amazing. Uh, Jade actively trying to seek out some form of help and t- attempting to get her life on track. Wonderful. Uh, Jade finally getting some much needed, though very unconventional therapy. Lovely. And I really hope everything on uh, Infinity Island goes fine and that this is definitely uh, just a nice rehab therapeutic retreat island and that there's nothing weird Oosh. about it. And it's great and it's fine. And I would like family day where Artemis brings Will and Leon and we all check up on Jade and she's doing so well uh, and getting herself on track. And I'm sure that'll all happen. I'm sure nothing will go wrong here. (laughs) Well, I also like, I, I like the note that you put before this is that Sensei's meditation area falls into a specific category of young justice items like bri- like bricks wardrobe wills clipboard some things are just destined to be destroyed no matter <laughs> how many times you rebuild them yep. um and this is one of them yeah i because i did i in, joked in my notes i'm like why does jade crash this helicopter apparently I jade that- apparently jade can fly a helicopter but can't land one <laughs> or just doesn't care <laughs> yeah there, what I what I think I'm most surprised by, and, I, and on the rewatch I feel more so, is that there is a chance that Infinity Island isn't as bad as we think it is. Yeah, um, there's there's just a lot going into that to make Vinton, and I don't know if it, if it's to ploy me in a direction that, that I don't need to go, but like the way that the the music is and the rest of the sound design how Artemis is portrayed in those moments feeling that it is the right choice for Jaden at that time race as, as is quoted, like he's never a liar. Um, that doesn't mean there isn't a half truth there. Sensei's full transparency of like, no, you guys are fools. This was totally manipulation from start to finish. Like what do you, what else would you think it was? Um, but that's not what we do here. So there is part of me that hopes Yes, that as I said, if and also I th- I feel it could go either way, and I'd believe it either way. Like if this turns out to actually just be like, hey, there are shades of gray, and sometimes people who were former villains are gonna who are our villains are still gonna do something that's okay, and everything's gonna get sorted out. I'm like, sure, that tracks with Young Justice, or there is a much more convoluted plan in place, and everything's gonna blow up, and it's all gonna be crazy, and I'd be like. That also tracks for Young Justice. This could go either way, and I'd believe it. Either way, I just I just want Jade to get home safe eventually. That's all I want. I can only hope. I just, I am, just me and Artemis both being like, hey, Jade, you want a redemption arc? You want a redemption arc? You could have a redemption arc. Nah. If you, do you just, you could. It's right here. Uh, because I'm trash and I want her to be okay. Yeah. Well, I feel like even in some ways, like Paula had a little bit of that, that redemption moment, the way that she illustrated like her views on Jade and um, asking Artemis to try and bring her back and, and things like that. I I mean, I thoroughly, I don't certainly, I certainly don't enjoy every Paula discussion, but I, <laughs> I did enjoy this one. I thought it was really, really good. <laughs> like she's not always right. She, but, but sometimes, <laughs> What I find, what I, I saw, I'm seeing some of my notes that we haven't gotten to. Yeah. Apparently, Jade just needs to get in the general area of Artemis and Will, and they know. They know she was there. <laughs> it's Not very, all the way it's, there. It's very, yeah. For all that, for all that Jade is a very, uh, very good assassin and very good at being sneaky, apparently Artemis and Will are both just like, we always know where you are. You can't. You think you think you can sneak up on us. 
And we have another book, which I mean, of course we have this book because it, it is the reference to the title of episode eight. Um, it, I know why the caged cat sings, which is in reference to the book by Maya Angelou. I know why the caged bird sings. Um, and that is what Artemis is reading when Jade shows up in one of the flashbacks. Artemis at a more reasonable age to be reading a piece of classic literature yes. this time around. Very funny to me to have a nine-year-old Artemis reading Tale of Two Cities a couple episodes back. I'm like, okay. <laughs> but yes, and there are, I will probably during the hiatus do some sort of reading deep dive into at least this book, if not a couple of the ones from Young Justice, because I'm like, I feel like there are thematic parallels, but I haven't read this one the way that I had actually read Tale of Two Cities. So I would need to do some more research before I can do a deep dive into that. Yeah. So the only other one I have is just a casual reference by Onyx to just drop it back to just like, oh, yeah, Papa Willie, a.k.a. Will Everett, a.k.a. The Amazing Man. That was my grandfather. And she really like, likes bringing sure. that up. Of course. Of course it was. Like, you're just tying back to the DC history. Of course you did. But she, she mentioned that a couple episodes back. I was like, okay, thank you for giving us your whole backstory again. I appreciate it. In case we'd have forgotten over the past two episodes. In case you haven't been repeatedly rewatching these episodes to write outlines about them. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think that's all of our Aster do we have some mode that we should crash? We do. Tell us something we don't know yet. Sorry, BB. We can't risk altering the time stream. We do that, we're all feeling the mode. In Crashing the Mode, we will be discussing potential storylines running through our heads based on the episodes released at the time of recording. This Crashing the Mode is based on episodes one through eight and the trailer. So I'm going to throw out an absolutely wild theory here, but hear me out. <laughs> <laughs> so we know the next arc is Zatanna, uh, Zatanna focused. And I had this thought the other day of McGann's headed back to Earth in a very bad emotional place. So what are the odds that uh, Artemis suggests that McGann should talk to Zatanna about doing that whole commune with your boyfriend's ghost thing that they did last season, only for McGann to finally let it slip in a fit of anger that actually they lied to her and that whole thing was fake? Because that could come up again. And this dawned on me the other day. And this totally might not happen. This is a very specific thing to theorize about, but... Oh, the sad park. Oh, the sad park. The park where people go to be sad. Yes, more often than not. No, I mean, it's, The women of the team have the sad park. Yeah, it's very plausible. Like, I mean, when I read the note, I was just like, yeah, 100%. And they, per, like, there was a level of resolution that came from that process for Artemis. Like, why wouldn't you bring it up? You've wanted to support your friend this whole time. She's been away for multiple months. So, oh, no. Because I know we, for the longest time, were saying that we're like, the fact that everybody lied to Artemis is going to come out eventually. And I remember back last season, we kept theorizing, we were like, it'll come out when Wally comes back. Because what more dramatic way is there to find out your friends lied to you than for your boyfriend not to actually be dead? But this would also mm -hmm. be interesting. And tie in more immediately to things. We'll we'll see. I just wanted to put that out into the world so that if it does happen, I can go. That's another weird one I predicted. Because sometimes I hold on to the weird theories, but sometimes I'm like, I need to share this with somebody. So yeah, that's my only thought right now. Other than like, we're getting a Zatanna arc. I'm sure there will be magic and... Uh, chaos and Dr. Fate and all of the things that are on the poster for the next few episodes. <laughs> yeah. So the ones I have were, I don't know that they're like full crash in the mode, but I like putting things here. That way we're not, you know, crashing when we don't need to, but like the idea that like if Emery's going on the trip back, what isn't happening anymore? Like, first off, like she had a very prominent role um, there on Mars, but like, does the Zeta tube stop? Like, is the satellite not a thing anymore? Is it just like dawned on me? Like, did she fix it in that, in that interstitial month before they're like, they're coming back or 
It was just like random. Yeah. Random thoughts of like, does that connection to Mars not happen now in the way that it was intended to happen? We'll see. We'll see. The satellite got blown up. So who knows if we can do the Zeta tube now without more communication stuff. She might have just decided to take a sabbatical. (laughs) It's like, I just I'm going to go on vacation to another planet for a while. We'll, We'll see. And we'll see what comes of Emery attempting to understand understand Earth. And I'm deeply concerned, and this is the one that I earlier went to go write, is like, oh, yeah, I can't imagine where, like, McCom went and all the terrible things that are either happening to him or with him. Like, oh, no, because you undoubtedly went back to where DeSalad is. And, like, will you be experimented on? Will they just do more terrible things that you ask them to do? Like another bomb? Because Macomb just went and took, just has a father box, just boom tubed out. And I'm sure that n- nothing bad will come of this. I'm sure it'll be fine. Uh, yeah. If I keep saying that, it'll be true, right? That's how that works. <laughs> I agree. I think that's that's all we that's all I have for now. Anything else I think we could save for another time. Yeah. I'm sure we'll have much more to talk about once the Zatanna arc gets fully underway. Uh, it's time for magic. It's a magical girl episode next week. <laughs> all the backwards talking. Yay. But with that, I think we can Zeta out of the watchtower. Thank you for spending time with us here today. If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on Tumblr at the YJFiles.tumblr.com, on our website, CrashingTheMode.com. And if that somehow is not enough for you, you can email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. And if you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The rate, the ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. If you do leave us a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you're outside the U.S., as those are much harder to find. If you are able to support us monetarily and would like to do so, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even $1 a month can help us bring you even more awesome discussion sessions, interviews, reviews, and more. And remember, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. Well